Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this instructional engaging cooking show. So today we are continuing our neighborhood cooking tour of Jamaica Plain at the Loring Greenhouse. House. And today we featured Chef Kelly Ransom, a Bella Luna restaurant in the Milky Way Lounge. Today she is making this amazing pop of color dish. It is a spring carrot and pea risotto with arugula and ginger salad. And from there we'll have other special segments that I'm sure you will enjoy. So let's go over to Joe and Kelly who are going to make this delicious recipe for us. I want to introduce tonight's chef. Uh, it's, her name is Kelly Ransom, and she is the chef manager at the Bella Luna restaurant in Jamaica Plain, which is, I would say, is a historical site because it's where the old Half and Ruffer Brewery was. It's the brewing site for Sam Adams, and more importantly, it's the home base for Bella Luna and Milky Way Restaurant, which is a really cool place when you walk inside. You think you're in Disney World because <laughs> of the, the decoration. So it really goes with the, you know, the idea of a Milky Way, and the food is fantastic, and we can owe that to Chef Kelly. So, Chef, chef what are we making today? We're going to make a carrot and English pea risotto. And the carrots and the English peas are from City Growers in Dorchester, so they're right. fresh picked. Right. You can get them at farmers markets right, right around now. It's yeah. peak season for Let them. Let me ask you a question. So, in your cooking at the restaurant, you're using a lot of sustainable products, yes. locally grown, yes. which is always great. You know, fresh is best. Uh, for the home chef, I just want to make one comment. We can't all afford to go out and get fresh parsley, fresh basil, fresh oregano, but you know, if you can do that, do it. It makes yeah. a huge difference in your finished product. So let me ask you a couple of questions about okay. your career track. I, you know, you told me that you started cooking at uh, the Rocks Diner in West Rocks. I started cooking at Bella Luna. Oh, okay. And then. I went to Rock's Diner in West Roxbury and a couple of places in between there. And great. then I went back to Bella Luna because I missed it so much. Oh, great. You know, uh, a lot of chefs, and I'm talking really top chefs, have come the direction or uh, learned the cooking field the way Kelly did, by studying on her own, working with some great chefs, and they didn't do the culinary school. And I would say we probably shot in two years, 80, 90 shows. I'd say 70% of the chefs did not go to culinary school. I went to a couple of culinary schools. They were technical, which was fine for me because I went later in life. But what it did for me was it just gave me more of a focus as to the methods of cooking and that type of thing. But it's really not necessary, and I think it's important to tell this story because you, the home chef, if you make a mistake, don't worry about it, okay? Mistakes are good. Yeah, yeah, because that's how you're going to learn. And, you know, it's a creative process, culinary arts. It's, it's a very artistic form of cooking, I guess, uh, simply said. So... If you want to change your recipe, you might like a little more basil or you might like a little lemon salt or whatever, that's up to you. You know your family, your friends, and who you're cooking for. But it's always great to follow a, an excellent chef like Kelly's, right? Sure. And I bet you're tough in the kitchen, are you? I'm a sweetheart. <laughs> okay, that's great. I can tell by that beautiful smile. <laughs> You must be Irish, are you? Yep. Oh, of course. Okay, <laughs> good. All right, so one thing you notice that Chef Kelly has her mise en place all set up, and that's really the first step 
and enjoying your cooking experience because you have all your ingredients and I always use the term like a symphony or an orchestra because when you're putting that dish together you want to bring all those instruments into play if you don't have it laid out and I've done this myself many times so I'm talking about experience I forget something and then when the dish is complete and say gee there's something that just doesn't taste right or it's missing something but when you have your mise en place you're not going to miss a step so chef is this a dish that you make at Bella Luna? Or? It's a variation of a dish that we make. We have a risotto on the menu, but um, I wanted to highlight some of the seasonal produce right now. And Excellent. The one on our menu is made with beets. Beets, oh, that sounds good. Um, which are peaking right now, but carrots, this is like prime time for carrots and peas. Okay. It sounds boring, carrots and peas, but they can be really exciting and beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, you know what, and that's a good point. When, you, when you're serving your family or you want that wow effect, you know, the brightness of the carrots, the peas, that's all part of the final dish, the presentation. So, and I think you're going to be showing us how to make that presentation yeah, at the end, correct? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I see we're using two saucepans yes. here. Okay, so we're not going to be sauteing and are in the vernacular or fry pan, a saute. Well, we will a little later. Okay, but fine. Just to <laughs> All right. So what, what are we going to do first? Chef? So the first thing that I like to do after I set up everything and have everything cut and measured, um, for risotto, you want a hot stock. You can use chicken stock, beef stock. I'm using vegetable stock. Um, this is a vegetarian dish cool. at our restaurant. Um, it's great because it can be modified to be a vegan dish as well, but today oh. I'm just making vegetarian. Okay. So we have vegetable stock um, heating up, right. and you want to get that hot first. Okay. And then you want to get your other pan really hot, right. and you want to take some extra virgin olive oil. Right. This might sizzle a lot. No, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Probably like a quarter of a cup. Right. No, I just, you can hear that crackling, and I'm, I'm glad Chef just said this. I've talked to many home chefs or cooks and they're afraid to get that pan smoking hot. You can see olive oil has a low heat tolerance, but you can see it's smoking. That's what you want. Yes. You want to draw those sugars, those flavors. You want that caramelization. This all is layering so that your finished product is going to be primo. Okay. Onion. <laughs> there you go, chef. A half of a Spanish onion or a yellow onion. That's a good sound. Right. That's what you want. And then our carrots. Take that. Yeah. This is a cup of carrots diced up. Uh, that's a small dice, medium dice? Small dice. Um, I didn't really have a choice. They're baby carrots right now. They're not fully grown. Right. And you want to saute it until it's translucent. Like, it takes a couple of minutes. Yeah, the onion you're talking um, about. I use a rubber spatula when I'm working, but wooden spoon works well too. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I was going to talk about your spatula. I had a friend at my house, and he used one of my spatulas, and it had a white handle. And I saw it in the sink, and I just said, ugh. And I picked it up, and it was melted down yeah. flat. This red handle is heat tolerant. So for you, the home chef, if you want to use a spatula, a red handle tolerates the heat. It's great because you can scrape the sides. You really right. get everything with the spatula. Right. The spoon, not so much, but the spoon's like authentic. Like. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you used the spatula because they're my pans and I don't want them scratched. Exactly. I don't want to mess up your pans. Boop. There you go. Right. All right. So let's say that's translucent. Okay. It takes a couple of minutes. Right. This is two cups of arborio rice. Okay. And we're going to add that before we add any liquid. Right. Now, I wanted to ask you a question yes. uh, about that. When I cook, it doesn't make any difference what type of rice it is. I always want to get that coated yes. with the oil that we've started the uh, sweating of your root vegetables. So you feel you should do the same? Or? Yes, I like to um, cook it a little. I like to get it toasted. I feel like it adds like a nuttier flavor. Right, and right. 
then it, it actually aids in the starch coming off of the rice once you start adding the liquid. Uh -huh. Excellent. I got to tell you, it's great having a straight vegetarian dish because generally we'll see a lot of protein and I was never a vegetarian or a vegan Me neither. and never wanted to be. But our co-host, Carol O'Connor, is a vegetarian, but she does eat fish. And I find that I'm eating more vegetarian type meals and they're very enjoyable. You know, there are many herbs, spices that you can add to a dish to really bring it to a great flavor so that you'll enjoy it. Okay, what are we doing? So we're adding two cups of Chablis white wine. It doesn't have to be Chablis. It could really be any white wine you have sitting in your house. This is like straight up cooking wine, so it's not fun to drink. Right. But if you want to drink a glass while you make it. Right. Um, and then I add all of this. Mm -hmm. And it gets... You know, when... Everything off the right. bottom of the pan. The way I was trained, when you trying to figure out, do I use a Chablis, a uh, Pouli Fousse, whatever, whatever you like to drink, that's what is recommended, okay? And uh, the big thing, once you put that wine, is cooking that alcohol off, right? Yes. So, you know, I'm sure that, you know, this is going to have to simmer for a few minutes to get rid of that alcohol flavor. Um, you can also skip this part entirely if you don't include alcohol in your diet and just go straight to the veg stock. Okay. This has a richer flavor, but it's not right. necessary. Yeah, as Chef just told you, you do not have to add wine. I feel the alcohol is literally cooked off. But again, that's a personal preference, so keep that in mind. So we can start with this. Okay. Um, so what's you usually want to wait till all the wines absorb, but that's going to take a okay, while. Right. Um, once the wines absorbed, there will be no more liquid in the pan, and you want to start adding your stock, maybe two ladles at a time. And this is the part that I always say when I'm in the kitchen: you can't walk away. And it takes a half an hour, about. So this is more of like a a dish you want to make on like a Sunday when you have lots of time or something. Right. Yeah, because um, you can always reheat this. It'll hold oh, up yeah. very it's well. Oh, yeah. It's actually really good for heating. Yeah, because the flavors are incorporated and merged much, uh, much better. But the reason that you want to keep stirring it and not walk away is you want to um, get as much starch off of the rice as possible and it makes the dish creamier and right. it makes it soft yeah. and it, it keeps it texture, but it's like I don't know how to... I, it has, <laughs> you want it to get to an al dente Yes, uh, but it's creamy texture. al dente. Right, right. I know a chef, she used to put heavy cream in at the end. I do too. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Matter of fact, she used to work in the restaurant right around the corner from your mother-in-law's house in Nouveau. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah, that Yeah, she's place. from Ireland and she used to put a little cream in her. I put uh, cream in everything. Right. You know, chef gave you a great tip. This is not a dish that you can really walk away from. No. Because as that liquid is absorbed, you don't want that rice to burn, okay? So you're constantly, as Chef explained to you, adding the liquid, a couple of ladles at a time, until you get that you know, nice creamy texture. Yeah, so I would say um, this was a quart, nah like two quarts of veg stock, pretty much want to use the whole pot of it. And um, you'll know once it's getting to the point of being ready to add the rest of your ingredients. Right. Um, it won't absorb the liquid as quickly and it will, you can see it, you can taste it, it's just like softer. You know, you're looking for the bite, meaning is it crunchy still or is it real chewy? You want to go a little bit beyond that chewy, right? Yes. So. Because we don't have all day, um, I brought some already cooked risotto. Well, Chef, you just gave away the magic of, of a cooking show. Okay? I don't think they want to watch me stir a pot for no, half an but hour. We, but that's okay. You're doing a great job. <laughs> what we're going to do we're gonna is... We're going to do a switcheroo. Yeah, because it takes such a long time that 
it would be like watching grass grow, right? Yes. So, so this is the finished product of all the liquid, the wine, the carrots, and the onions. And once it, uh, I'm going to add a little more veg stock just to moisten it up a little. Okay. But once it starts getting to this point, you're almost there. It's time to start adding the other ingredients. So I have these English peas. This is what they look like at the supermarket. Wow. Um, this is look, they look like when you open them up. These are hot right now. They're the best at the end of the spring. Okay, and that's a great tip. So if you want the fresh, these English peas. But frozen, it's totally fine. I'm just adding a little salt and pepper. Okay. Um, if you want to make this in the dead of winter, it would still be good. Yeah, let's just talk a minute about, and I've talked about this a few times on different shows, these burners are called induction burners and they're very, very efficient. There's no flame, and it's not an electric, per se, burner. It works with magnetism, and these are special pans. And to me, the downside of induction burning is the expense of the pans, because you have to buy special pans, otherwise you won't get the heat transfer. But when you take that pan off within seconds, the burner top is, you could put your hand right on it, it cools and your pan can cool very quickly as opposed to a gas burner. Okay, chef, sorry about that. No, Where that's fine, we? this is getting, this is getting sexy. So okay. we wanna add, I like to cook with any greens attached to my vegetables. I think it enhances the flavor, it's usually beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the top of the carrots. They have a little bit of carrot flavor, but it's, you know, they're totally edible. You can eat beet greens, you can eat, I don't know, any greens really. Right. Um, so I always, if I have them, I add them. I feel silly throwing them away. Right. So this is like a cup of the greens. There's a great tip, you know, using everything that you have. Don't waste. No, I do not like to waste anything. If right. I can make something out of it, I will. Excellent. So we'll stir that up in there. I'll tell you, the, the aromas are starting to come up and it really smells excellent. This is when I add the heavy cream. Okay. So this is about a cup and a half. And you can use light cream, you can use no cream. If you're vegan, you don't use any cream. But right. it really makes it good. Right. You know, I'm sure that what I'm about to say that people that are in dietary fields or nutritional fields would maybe roll their eyes at me. But this is a very rich yes. dish. So for me, I wouldn't be afraid to use heavy cream because it's not like I'm eating it seven days a week. Exactly. Okay. To me, if I balance my food intake and you know be reasonable other days, I personally don't see a problem with it. But now that I'm saying that, <laughs> I, I realize this chef's coat's getting a little snug, so maybe I've w been eating rich, too many rich foods. It's about to get a little richer. I like this dish to be like hearty. Right. Um, we're gonna add some goat cheese. Wow. But you could really add any cheese. Yeah. This is a really versatile dish. You could do any vegetables, anything you want. I like goat cheese. How about um, a nice gorgonzola? Have you done anything with that? Uh, with that blue, that's the Italian blue cheese. I would, but I would probably use some different ingredients in here. I love gorgonzola, bacon, corn. Oh. That's like one of my favorite combos. So I might, wow. you could do that. Bacon and risotto is really good. Yeah. Um, so I'm just stirring this to get. Right, now would you use a in. pancetta type bacon? Oh yeah, you could do that. Yeah. You know, um, I mentioned gorgonzola, but when you get into the blue cheese, you're going to get a much stronger, heartier flavor. So keep that in mind. So maybe the Salty. goat cheese, you're so smart. <laughs> that was a better option. Goat cheese you can use a lot of. It, uh, it's tangy. Yeah, yeah. It's acidic and, and it's just a great cheese. Um, and you know, again, I, I hate to bring up the wolf pack. If, <laughs> if you're not from the city of Boston, wolf pack are the Boston Latin School graduates, which Chef is. And uh, I don't know where I was going with that. So let's, <laughs> let's just keep cooking, so. And then I'm gonna add some Romano. Oh my God. This, this is really fragrant, grated Romano yeah. cheese. Wow. 
Just what a great dish. Did, did, was this your idea to come up with this recipe? Or? Yeah. I just <laughs> Excellent. I do this, I don't know. How does your husband Chris stay so slim? He hides it well. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't cook like this at home all the time. Mm. This is so nice, so, bubbling, yeah. good. Wow. We're almost there. The final richness. Butter. Butter. Wow. I'm going to do two. I usually mention butter. Unsalted. Thank you very Sorry. much. <laughs> In professional kitchens, professional bakeries, unsalted butter. And I strongly recommend even the home cook to use unsalted butter. Because when you get to the end of that dish, you can always adjust salt, pepper, whatever. But in this case, I'm obviously talking about salt. And another thing about butter, if you're buying, if you switch your cooking to unsalted butter, buy it in the one pound block form. Block has less water in it, okay? So as far as the nutritional part, you got more fat. But hey, who cares, once a month? Yeah. So the butter's almost melted. This is the part where you can walk away and have the other components of the dish prepared. I should have talked about this first probably, but I have a carrot puree. Um, it's just carrots, peeled, boiled, with a clove of garlic. You take mm -hmm. out the garlic, stick it in the blender, wow. a little cream, a little butter. Right. Um, <laughs> but I really wanted this dish to just be all carrot, sing carrot. So I wanted to showcase it in another way. I just remembered what I was gonna say about the wolf packers. You're so creative, okay? <laughs> I mean, who would think of pureeing a carrot and adding it to the risotto? Well, well Kelly Oh, would. sorry. <laughs> um, I use it at the bottom of the dish because I think it's beautiful. Oh, great. And you don't have to do this at home. This is just me being fancy. Mm -hmm. So I put that at the bottom of the bowl, and... Why don't we just hold it up just sure. for a little bit longer, then they can see that, okay? So there's your carrot puree. You can put it on the plate. You can you could throw it in with the risotto. I think it's a great idea putting it on the plate because then it's a surprise. Yeah, exactly. I love surprises. Um, so to finish the dish, we're going to make a little salad to go on top before we plate it. Uh, this is arugula. It's nice. also from the farm in Dorchester. Yeah. It's my favorite green. It's very bitter. I feel like it goes with everything. Yeah. It's an acquired taste, though. Right. Yeah, it's peppery and... Yes. So, you know, that's something else. You know, when you're cooking, keep in mind what the finished product's going to be like. You have a, uh, the arugula, which has a, a peppery uh, note in it, so that it may influence the final dish if you put too much pepper in there. So these are the things as you're cooking. Exactly. Just keep thinking through what you're doing, what you want to accomplish. So actually, I'm going to add some candy ginger. Oh, um, you can buy this. It's usually in the produce section. Okay. You can also make it at home, but it's like a week-long process. Yeah. So this is we'll store-bought. Right. Okay. <laughs> Just a little. So and it's covered in sugar, so it's adding a sweetness that's going to like really enhance the natural sweetness of the carrots and the peas. Right. Wow. Um, a little olive oil. What a great dish. You're, you're really balancing out this recipe. A squeeze of a lemon wedge. Mm. You can... Add a little more if it's dry. Yeah. Ooh. You know, I like to make a quick dressing at home the way Kelly is with lemon and olive oil. And some salt. You know, and you want an EVOO extra virgin olive oil, but it really makes a terrific dressing. So, as you can see, with two cups of risotto, we got a meal for probably four people. Right. You get a lot. Um, and it's really rich, too, so you can do a small serving. It's great for a large crowd. Right. And I just spoon it. Wow, that is, it, the smell is terrific, I gotta tell you. And uh, on last week's uh, show, I talked about smell vision, and you know, I think maybe we could all score big if we put our heads together, <laughs> because it, it's huge. Oh, I can smell the lemon. So I just toss this a little. Um, I like to have the, you know, 
the, so it's not a total surprise, and it just looks really nice to have the puree showing, so I just right. put the risotto right in the middle. Yeah, once you get your salad on there, we're going to show the, the, uh, the camera how great this dish looks. Oh and then, finishing touch of most everything that I make is some shaved Parmesan cheese. Oh, I love that. Love and it. And there we go. Chef, this is fantastic. <laughs> I, I've got to tell you, this is absolutely a meal, okay? And you'd be very satisfied, maybe a little grilled bread with this. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you can add meat to it, too, if you want. Right. Yeah. And we, I, had it, I made it last night at home, and we used veal. We had it with veal. Really? It was do, great. Do you have any leftovers? I don't know if Chris ate them for lunch or oh, not. Okay. <laughs> I figured I'd stop by and go <laughs> Well, this has been great, Chef. This is fun. Yeah, and you know, Chef gave you some great uh, tips, particularly just from the very beginning. She's using locally grown products, and she's bringing produce in that's in the season. And that says something about the kitchen at Bella Luna, that you're going to get a great eating experience because everything is fresh, fresh, fresh. Super fresh. And I can tell you all the ingredients she used, that shaved Parmesan, and just wonderful. So uh, it's, I'm gonna come over. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it, it, it's great. And I'm really pleased that you came tonight. And we wanna thank you, Kelly. Thank you for Chef having Kelly. me. Kelly. And on the Chef's Table series.tv website, you'll see a, uh, did I already say angelic picture? <laughs> of Kelly <laughs> will be on there along with her recipe so that you can follow Chef Kelly, all right, and do this at home. And that's what we want to do. We want to see people having more family meals, okay? Still go to your great restaurants, but at least once a week, <laughs> have that family meal. We'd like to thank the Bella Luna Restaurant, Milky Way Lounge, as well as the Lauren Greeno House, which I consider a jewel in the city of Boston. And this has been a fantastic place to shoot our show and the Tuesday Club that keep this facility. There's a lot of history in here and it's a gem. Is that about right? Sounds Kelly? right to me. All right, great. <laughs> Thanks again and we'll see you next time. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's beer pairing and today Kelly Ransom that you just saw the chef at Bella Luna restaurant in the Milky Way Lounge made, made a delicious vegetarian dish and as many of you know I am a vegetarian so she made this really creamy risotto yep. so I'm here with um, Rob Costa of the Massachusetts Beverage Alliance and we're going to talk more about this Beer that you chose. Yeah. It's a big beer. Yeah, that's the thing. Usually people look and they're like, is that wine? No. <laughs> it's, um, it's a format that beer comes in. 22 ounces. Oh. You know, for special stuff like this. Yeah. Um, it's a lot this, of beer. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's can use <laughs> more share. sometimes. Yeah. Exactly. Table beers. Good, good to share. Mm -hmm. um, this one is the Backlash Brewing Company's Ground Swell. It's a Belgian blonde ale. So mm -hmm. it's going to go very well, I think, with the risotto. It's very light. Uh, the brewer is local, mm -hmm. um, right out of Boston, and oh. yeah, so it's kind of nice that way. Yeah. Um, you know, with the with the ginger, I thought it'd be kind of interesting. They do uh, have an addition of Indian coriander in the beer, so I think that oh. would probably work well. And you're gonna see it's very spritzy and yeah, it's quite nice. So. What do you mean by spritzy? It's got a tighter carbonation, so think uh, almost like a champagne. Or, you know, say a Prosecco or something like that. You're going to see it's very oh, tight really? carbonation. Hmm. Lots of little head, which is always good. I'm usually good about getting it right to where it has to be. Um, Should all beers have heads or it depends on the beer? It depends on the beer. Um, to be honest with you, I think all beers should have a generous head because, you know, most people say, well, I don't want to have to wait, but good beer is worth waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can calm down with the head. Uh -huh. um, usually, you know, you, you have a good, nice fluffy cloud you had like that mm -hmm. you know you could float a cap on it i think i would but i don't want to go fishing it out <laughs> again um 
So if you just give this beer a whiff, which is great to do uh -huh. while you're waiting for that mm -hmm. head to recede, you get a lot of those phenols. What's that? Well, uh, it's a byproduct of yeast after fermentation. Um, actually, it comes out uh, pretty predominantly in Belgian ales because mm. they're uh, bottle fermented, uh, mm -hmm. which means that all this carbonation is 100% uh, natural. They're not actually carbonating the beer. Beforehand, you put in an extra amount of yeast that eats yep. the sugar that's just kind of hanging out in the bottle after fermentation to create another uh, fermentation that will result in carbonation. Oh. So, very interesting chemical. And, yeah, it uh, sounds like a chemistry yeah. class. Yeah, it was never and really that much of a chemist. Yeah, That's why I'm, I'm a better at drinking <laughs> and, and smelling and getting <laughs> it in my beard like you're going to see. Um, so yeah, so you get you, you can pull out a little of that Indian coriander. Mm -hmm. I think you get it. You do get it in the uh, aroma a bit. But a not bit. as much. Um, we'll have to taste it. That's correct. That's, yeah. We'll taste it. I like it. Good move. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? I like this one. Isn't nice. Rob, mm. good, good choice. Usually, I make a good decision once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this yeah, is, it has it's um, very light. It's very light, very light. Little citrusy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's the use of the hops. It's actually interesting. That it's uh, brewed with four types of malt. Mm -hmm. uh, including Pilsner malt, so you're getting, uh, it's very, very clean. Um, the malt really doesn't get too, too intense, but mm -hmm. it's definitely an element. Um, really, I think the showcase here is the yeast. Uh, a lot of people always think it's, you know, it's hops or malt that really uh, tend to be the showcase for right. beers like this, but Belgian beers, for me, it's the yeast, that's why you drink them, because they definitely have that, those nice um, fruity esters, you mm -hmm. know, those, you know, little little yeah. things that come out from the yeast. Yeah, this so. definitely complements because it yeah. it's not overpowering. No, not by any means. Like no. It, it complements and you can still get all the flavor from the ginger mm -hmm. and even the arugula has that peppery note to Absolutely. it. So That's, um, actually I was going to get to that. That's an awesome oh. observation. Thank you, I love you food. Because you do have, <laughs> and I love beer. Um, you do have a very peppery phenol from it, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is great with that like kind of spicy bitterness mm -hmm. uh, that you definitely get from that beer, uh, just from the yeast strain that they use. So, Rob, yeah. they picked another great one. Doing what I can Love do. it, awesome. Yeah. All right, so everyone, this has been um, this week's beer pairing of the week with Kelly Ransom's risotto, and we'll see you next week. Hello everyone, and welcome to the wine pairing of the week. Today, we, we, I'm here with John Paul. He's the wine manager at Blanchard's Wines and Spirits, and we are doing a wine pairing for Chef Kelly Ransom, a Bella Luna, restaurant in the Milky Way Lounge, her risotto that she just cooked with Joe on the show. So you have a cold bottle, so I'm assuming it's white? It's white. You chose a white? Although the, the glass is quite dark. It is quite dark. I can't really see it. <laughs> um, it's from Austria. Whenever you get an Austrian wine, you always have that little... Um, oh, like a flag? Yeah. Kind of. I guess so, kind of. You always recognize it on the shelf. Right. But anyways, this is from Austria. It's mm -hmm. a Riesling, mm -hmm. um, one of the two major white grapes from Austria. Um, the other being Grüner Veltliner, which a lot of people know mm -hmm. as kind of like the only Austrian wine. Oh. But Gebling there is the vineyard site, so okay. it's like the specific piece of land where it comes from, and Kremstal is the region. Oh, um, okay. And the guy who makes it is Hermann Moser. So, do you want to try it? I do, yes. And you had mentioned it's one of your favorites? Yeah, it's yes. one of my new favorites. Yep. And uh, it, uh, I mean, I love Riesling. Riesling is one of the great um, grapes of the world, white or red. I agree with you. Okay, cheers. Cheers. I agree with you on that. Um, um, but it's kind of unfashionable because everybody thinks it's always sweet. Um, and for some true. reason, sweet wines are not often considered to be sophisticated or, you know, um, it's like everybody likes, you know, everybody could like a sweet wine just because it's sweet, you know, everybody likes right. sweetness. But um, so a dry wine, supposedly, is more serious. But this is definitely on the dry side for Riesling. Mm -hmm. um, not that a sweet Riesling couldn't be serious. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but. Anyways, when it comes to reasoning, I will go on and on. So let's just try it. Mm. Oh, I can see why the, the audience love this wine. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's a, not what a lot of people would expect, I think, from mm -hmm. reasoning. It's got that powerful acidity. Right. How um, come you chose this one? I know it's your favorite. Yeah. But how come you chose this one with the, um, the risotto, the spring risotto? Uh, well, it had a little bit of ginger in it. It That did. crystallized ginger. Mm -hmm. So that it's would add a little you know, sweetness and spiciness. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were like a lot of delicate vegetable flavors in there, like yeah. uh, peas mm -hmm. and carrots. Yep. Um, and I really thought that this would, well, I, just I thought it would work. I think uh, it definitely works. Mm. 
it's refreshing. Mm -hmm. I can I can see why people would definitely um, yeah give you accolades for choosing such a great yeah wine pairing. Yeah, the risotto had a certain richness to it. You know, in itself, it, risotto it, is like it, a rich, you know, rich, full yes. and flavored dish, and yeah. the acidity there in this wine is going to mm -hmm. cut through that. But then right. I thought also some of the flavors would interplay nicely, um, and. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, well, especially because risotto is, like you said, it's heavy. Yeah. People think heavy dish, fall, winter. Yeah. But when she inserted a lot of those vegetables, mm -hmm. and I find this is a very enjoyable light wine. Yeah. I think it works well. Yeah, definitely. And cheers. You've cool. done it again. Great Thank you. job. So everyone, this has been the wine pairing of the week with Bella Luna's risotto dish. And I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table series. And I'm John Paul with Blanchard's Wines and Spirits. Um, here on behalf of the Chef's Table Foundation. Perfect, thank you. And um, we'll see you next week. Due to popular demand, we are going to re-air one of our most popular Chef's Tips of the Week segments. Hi folks, Steve LeCount, chef owner of Chiara Bistro in Westwood, uh, coming at you this week with this week's Chef's Tip of the Week. I want to talk this week a little bit about avocados. Um, there are a couple of different types of avocados you can buy. Uh, one has a, a bumpier skin and then there's one with a smooth skin like this. Uh, depending on the application, I might prefer one over the other. Uh, for just slicing them and putting on top of a salad, I, I might buy the one with the bumpier skin that tends to be a little bit firmer. But if you're going to make guacamole for some uh, salsa and chips and things like that, uh, you might want to prefer this one. And it's important to buy them and just kind of pinch it with your thumb and when you see that little indentation, um, you don't want it too mushy but you don't want it firm at all. But I see people, what I really want to show you is how quickly you can peel one of these. Uh, they are very slippery and I see people you know, doing this and, and taking the skin off and then when they get around here it's sliding in their hands and stuff, uh, things like that. So the easiest way is, first of all, have a very sharp knife and just start at the top and you'll feel the pit when you get to the middle and just make a circle, circular cut all the way around the perimeter and then just twist the avocado. Okay, and to get that pit out I'll use a little bit larger knife but be careful when you do this but take good aim and just Go into the pit and twist the knife quickly and that comes right out. And so side note, this side of the avocado, if you want to put three toothpicks in there and put it in a glass of water, it might sprout roots and you may be able to grow yourself a little nice looking avocado plant as well. So once you get to this stage, just take a spoon and again, the avocado has to be ripe to do this and then you just scoop it out. And there's no muss, no fuss. Um, with this avocado sliding all over your hands and all over the cutting board. And then from there, you can just do whatever you prefer with it. You know, if you're making guacamole, you can just kind of press it down and chop it up, turn it that way. And keep chopping it for like a mushy, you can puree it, make an avocado puree uh, in your food processor. But it's by far the easiest way to get an avocado out of its skin uh, without dealing with it sliding around in your hands. Add a little bit of light cream and lime juice and make a nice silky smooth avocado puree. And this is Steve LeCount with this week's Chef's Tip of the Week. Hi, I'm Marjorie Gann and I work at Ethos in Jamaica Plain. And we're an organization that serves elders and people of all ages with disabilities. We're also the nutrition provider for Southwest Boston. So we serve Meals on Wheels, community cafes and provide in-home nutrition consultation. I've been a registered dietitian, wife and mom for over 30 years, so I've developed some pretty good nutrition tips to help that are practical and easy to do. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about sodium. Sodium is half of, the, of salt, which is actually sodium chloride, and it's estimated that in this, the United States, people eat about, to say, give or take, 2,500, 3,500, 2,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Now the Institute of Medicine says it should only be 1,500. And for people who eat a lot of salt, which probably would be males around 30, you're actually talking as much as, say, 4,000 milligrams. So here's a little quiz. Here are three foods, and they have different amounts of sodium. Which food on this table is the saltiest? Is it the hamburger bun, my little chocolate cupcake, 
or the ounce of potato chips? And I will bet that 80% of you will say it's the potato chips. But being sneaky, these are actually the lowest sodium food on this table. This is an ounce of potato chips. These happen to be a reduced fat potato chip which have less salt on them. So these come in at 85 milligrams for this size serving. The cupcake, and this is a pretty little cupcake if you look at it, 135 milligrams, and you'd probably eat both of the ones that came in the package. And the hamburger bun is the surprise because that's got 220 milligrams of sodium. So if you add into this the hamburger, the french fries, and probably maybe four tablespoons of ketchup, we're really looking at 1,000 milligrams in this one meal versus the Institute of Medicine's recommendation of 1,500 milligrams for the entire day. So you can see why those 30-year-old men are getting their excess sodium. So the easiest way is to cut down on sodium, probably eat fewer processed foods, lots more fresh fruits and vegetables. And that's my tip for the day. I'm Marjorie Gann, and I'm here for Chef's Table. Thank you for joining me. Hi everyone and welcome to the restaurant interview segment of the Chef's Table Series. Today I am sitting with Carol Downs, owner of the Bella Luna Restaurant and Milky Way Lounge. Carol, thanks for being on the segment with me today. Carol, it's such a pleasure. Thank you. Where did you come up with the name? It's so fun and unique. Well, there is a story behind that. We were brainstorming names yep. and the movie Moonstruck came out. Oh, I just saw that a couple of weeks ago. There's the First great time. scene where the grandpa goes outside with all the dogs and there's the moon and he goes, La Bella Luna. And so uh -huh. um, when we were brainstorming, that scene came up yeah. and we picked the name because oh. it's in, the, it means the same thing in Spanish mm -hmm. and Italian. Beautiful Moon, right. and oh. our original location was right on the edge of a very Spanish-speaking neighborhood, mm -hmm. a Latino part of JP, mm -hmm. and so and we wanted to bring that culture into our business and into right. our food, and so that's why we called it Bella Luna. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> that's a great story. Now, we're outside in your patio, which is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, I called it an oasis. Yes. Um, tell me how many seats you have out here. Out About. here we have around 35 seats. Mm -hmm. We're open seven nights a week yep. and weather permitting, the patio is always <laughs> open. Yep. We don't take reservations on the patio because there's such high demand. Oh, sure. So everybody can just come on in and enjoy the oh, patio. Perfect. Now tell me about the cuisine. I know there's some popular dishes people enjoy here. Well, we really built our reputation with our gourmet pizza. Oh. Um, you know, we make our own pizza dough and sauce yep. here every day. Mm -hmm. All of our pizzas are hand tossed. Oh, wow. um, but a few years into the business, we've now been around, this is our 21st year. I saw that. Congratulations. I, thank you Carol. so much. Um, wow. So a few years into it, we really wanted to expand our food profile beyond the pizza. Mm -hmm. And so we now have a really well-developed, delicious, full menu, including you know, bar snacks, right. appetizers. We have mm -hmm. delicious, unique salads that we create ourselves. Oh, which we, um, which you love in the summertime pastas mm. and mm. then entrees and every day we're offering a vegan special and um, a fish special and then one entree special and usually there's a pizza special yeah. and that way all of our regulars we yeah. have a lot of regulars can always find something new to try on the menu yes, because our specials are changing and we keep them very seasonal exactly. and so um, we also offer a lot of vegan and gluten-free options mm -hmm. for our diners because it's, it's very popular now, now. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, know, that's a, lot. a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. So people can still come back once or twice a week and get something totally different. A lot of people eat here regularly. Oh, I'm regularly. sure. Well, it's beautiful. Um, now, inside, I love it. Thank you. It has you. the stars and everything. And how did you come you. up with the design of that? Because I know, now, how long have you been in the, this is the brewery complex, correct? This is the old Half and Refer Brewery. Yeah. And it's been redeveloped over the last 15 years mm -hmm. uh, by the JPNDC. That's our landlord. Uh -huh. And we were the last space to get redeveloped. Oh. And so we were so able cool. to design the restaurant ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we had been at our location in Hyde Square for 15 years and had to relocate. Right. Um, and we were very lucky to find this oh, spot. Oh, it's beautiful. Actually, Joe Garufi from Sophia's Grotto mm -hmm. in Rosendale helped us design the inside. Oh, he did? Um, he did. Everything's um, connected, as Kelly was saying I earlier. know, I know. <laughs> So all the nice, nice low walls that make mm -hmm. little nice dining areas, that was Joe. little nooks and stuff. And it was our idea to have a U-shaped bar yep. so that 
when people are sitting across from each other, it just kind of creates a nice social right. circle yep. as opposed to a long straight bar. Right, where you're not... Um, yep. that's and that's worked out really clever. well. And then we have the back room, which sometimes is dining and then mm -hmm. can also be rented out for parties. And then we do entertainment uh, different nights of the week. Yes, back tell there. me about, you know, you call that area the Milky Way Lounge. So yes. tell me more about that, the entertainment events you have. So Bella Luna Restaurant is kind of the dining side of right. our personality. And then the entertainment <laughs> side of our personality yep. is the Milky Way Lounge. And so um, we do uh, trivia during dinner on Mondays, mm -hmm. but we have queer country line dancing back there yep. every Tuesday. We have a bunch of different spoken word nights. We have DJ wow. dance nights. Yep. We do live bands. So it's really quite wow. a wide variety. Oh, we, and we have some great comedy nights on oh. Wednesdays. So every night you'll, you have some type of entertainment going on? Pretty much every night there's yeah. something different. Sundays, wow. Sunday nights there's not much going on. But. Wow, so, that's a, so would you say this space is a lot bigger than your old space? The old space was much physically bigger because we had all the bowling lanes. Like you're downstairs. <laughs> yeah, it was that. Yep. huge basement. Yeah. Um, so this space, our dining room is much bigger here, and to have the bar and the dining room all in the same place, like they used to oh, be that's separate. Right. That's right. They we were had separate. the kitchen upstairs and yep. the bar downstairs, so it's nice to have it all in one yeah. space. So you know, even though it was probably challenging back then, five years ago, but it's. You know, things happen for a reason. Yes. And this is beautiful. This thank is you so beautiful. much. So thank Carol, you. Thank you for being on the restaurant interview segment with me today on this gorgeous day outside in your beautiful oasis of a patio. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. our pleasure to have you. Perfect. Thanks. So everyone, this has been the restaurant interview segment of the Chef's Table series, a production of the Chef's Table Foundation. And we will see you next week. Hi everyone, my name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table Series. As you know, we have been spotlighting four restaurants from Jamaica Plain, and we have been filming the shows at the Lauren Greeno House in Jamaica Plain. With me is Marika Van Dam. She is the president of the board of directors of the Jamaica Plain Tuesday Club. So we're going to talk about her club, we're going to talk about the beautiful Lauren Greeno House, and get some more information for you. So, uh, Marika, thanks for being on the um, interview segment with me. And um, tell me about the club and its history as well as the Lauren Greeno House. Sure. Thanks for being here, Carol. It's a real pleasure thanks. to have you guys. The club is this amazing resource here in Jamaica Plain. It was founded in 1896 as a ladies' organization. Really? The club never had a real place to meet, and mm -hmm. they were always looking for a place to have all their activities, their meetings, and their events. Yeah. This building, this house, the Lauren Greeno House, was built in 1760. 1760, okay. So prior to the club being formed, yep. there were families that lived here for many, many years. Let's fast forward to the 1920s, okay. when the last family was going to sell this building. Mm -hmm. They were selling it to developers, and it was going to turn into apartment buildings. Any other, it could have been any other block here in Jamaica Plain. Right. Luckily for us, the Jamaica Plain Tuesday Club, the ladies stepped up and purchased this house and have had it ever since. Wow, Th that's pretty remarkable, 1920s. I know, they were a very resourceful group of ladies. Oh, I see. <laughs> we are not a ladies club any longer. Since yep. the 1990s, we've allowed mm. men into the club, so we're quite progressive oh, in that sense. Okay. Um, now we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization, yep. and we hold events and activities here for the public. Oh, fun. Now you do this great farmer's market when I was talking to Andrew Zaro, who is the executive director of JP Center South Main Streets. Um, tell me about that. So one of our exciting programs mm -hmm. is called Thursdays on the Lawn. Every Thursday, oh. we have a farmer's market out yep. here on our property. Mm -hmm. We also have two food trucks that are very popular. Oh, oh they're so big here. So good. Boston, yep. um, and we have other events. We have, uh, when we partner with JP Center South, we have yep. music on the lawn. We've also had some events. Uh, we've just started having films mm -hmm. on the lawn, so a lot of great things. It's so encouraging to see people of JP yep. come here, meet their friends, yeah. lay out blankets, and hang out. The yeah. kids love it. They're running around the property. Yep. Everyone's really respectful, yep. and everyone just has a great time. And we love being the place where JP meets its neighbors. Yep, I know, and it's right smack in the middle of Absolutely. Jamaica Plain, the Lauren Greeno House, and it's beautiful. Right the across flowers. from the monument. Right. It's uh, so easy to get to. It's a jewel in JP. Just thinking about Boston and how it can be overdeveloped in places, if the ladies had not, not saved this I building, know. it would just be another block of 
I don't know, uh, grocery okay. store, yeah. convenience store, yeah. nothing special, nothing like it is yeah. today. It's really, it pops when you're coming from, you know, Center Street, South Street, like right in the middle. Exactly. Um, now, can people take tours in here? So Lauren Greenhouse, as I said, 1760 mm -hmm. Georgian Mansion, amazing. And it's very important to us, the yeah. club, to have this space available for the public mm -hmm. to enjoy, but also to learn about. Right. So we have tours mm -hmm. on a regular basis here. We also have, um, in the winter months, we have a series called Tuesday Night Club. Oh, where people that? come and on Tuesday nights, yep. reflecting our Jamaica Plain Tuesday Club name, yep. listen to lectures, play games, do some events, just a lot of reasons to gather. We also yeah. have concerts that you can attend. You can imagine a concert in oh. this space. It's amazing. So a lot of opportunities to interact with the house, learn about its mm -hmm. history. We have a number of special events coming up this year. Oh, um, in the summer, we're going to have a garden party on the lawn. You are? Croquet, oh. bocce, some, you know, drinking some white wine right. out on the lawn under a tree. Um, fancy dress is encouraged, oh, I'm so going to that. look forward to that. I like dresses. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. Oh. Um, we're also planning to do a reprise of an event we did last year, which had a, a spiritual medium come to the house and talk about. Um, uh, what spirits may be living here. Oh, that'll be fun. That was very successful. Yeah. Um, so we're hoping to do that again mm -hmm. around Halloween time. Oh, Marika, perfect. I know. Perfect. It's going to be great. We yeah. have so many amazing things going on. There are often weddings happening on the property. People rent oh, really? out this space. Some of our nonprofit neighbors use this space for yep. meetings and mm -hmm. events. So we really try to make it accessible to everyone. Oh, i, I got to find out about all this so stuff. So much stuff going on. Mm -hmm. All of our events oh. are open to the public in between our when we're renting out the space for weddings or other special events. So we look forward to welcoming everyone to the property. Oh, definitely. Well, Marika, thank you so much. Thank you. So everyone, um, this is Carol of uh, the Chef's Table Series and this is the beautiful Lauren Greeno house that we have been featuring for restaurants in Jamaica Plain. And um, thank you for watching. We want to add, I like to cook with any greens attached to my vegetables. I think it enhances the flavor, it's usually beautiful. Um, so this is the top of the carrots. They have a little bit of carrot flavor, but it's you know, they're totally edible. You can it just looks really nice to have the puree showing. So I just right. put the risotto right in the middle. Yeah, once you get your salad on there, we're gonna show the, 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 uh, the camera how great this dish looks. And then, finishing touch of most everything that I make is some shaved Parmesan cheese. Oh, I love that. Love and it. And there we go.